Thank you. <clears throat>
be used to using in English. But there's a list of possible things that have changed over my lifetime that have led to healthcare and dying being so different. The one that you may not, you may find surprising is conspiracy. But this is 2018. We have to have a conspiracy. Um, uh, and this is the conspiracy. So this was a, Jane Weeks is a very interesting writer. She's actually an oncologist in America. But she had di people dying of metastatic cancer and she, uh, 70 to 80% of them expected to be cured. Um, which is obviously untrue, almost none of them would have been. These had solid cancers that had spread and failed chemotherapy. Um, but what she found was that the most popular oncologists were the ones agreeing with them that they would be cured, even though they knew that they wouldn't be cured. And this gets worse because um, a palliative care specialist called Eduardo Borrera um, discovered, did a randomized controlled trial and discovered that the more you lied to patients, the more they liked you and the more they thought you were compassionate. Do you see how this then the doctors don't want to tell the truth and the patients don't want to tell them the truth so it just goes round and round and we end up in a very unfortunate situation, I think. This is not the main driver, I'm just wanting you to have a conspiracy so you, you have to have your conspiracy. I think the main thing that's happened is that all our, all our population have become so much older. Um, this is the demographic shift. We're dealing with much older people now than we used to 20 years ago. And part of the reason for that is medicine. Uh, we have saved a lot of lives in this time. I'm very pleased with this. I, I think it's a fantastic outcome that we have such an old population because what it means is they're not dying young. And this is, the, this is Australian data, but it's very, very much the same for Denmark. But in the age group of preventable death, 35 to 69, um, we have made this huge change in, since the 1950s, 1960s, 1950s, which is absolutely fantastic. And it isn't all due to me. <laughs> but... But it is largely due to medicine. This isn't clean water. This is not the simple things. This is actually medical intervention that's done this. It's very been a very powerful thing that we've done. And the result of that is that over 90% of Australians, and no doubt Danish, live to be old. But if you live to be old, when you come to die, everything is different. Um, if you, if you die older, you die of different things. If you die of different things, you die in a different way. If you die in a different way, you die in a different place. It's, it's changed everything about how medicine works. And we've reached a point, at least in Australia, that most people now die due to a decision to either stop something or not to start something. Mostly that decision is made by other people, not the patient. Most of that, at least in Australia, is still in acute care hospitals. Mostly these deaths are not anticipated and mostly the deaths are poorly managed when they happen. This was just, f this is from Melbourne w in Australia, but there was no discussion of end of life until the last 24 hours in two out of three patients. That the wishes of the patient were known and followed in less than one in four and there was unresolved conflict in one in three. And this is a study we did in Newcastle most of the deaths were on the medical wards, but when we looked through their notes, 20 of the patients who died, there was no mention that they were dying even in their notes. 10 only had a no CPR order. Um, in most of them, the observations, the OBS, the vital signs were being measured all the time. In fact, almost all of them had a blood test on the day they died. Go figure. One in five of them was waiting for a CT or MRI scan on the day they died. Gives you some idea of how much this is not being anticipated at the moment and only one in four had any kind of palliative care referral. So look, we, we decided that something had to be done to fix this, and the thing that came up was what Lisa most mentioned in her last talk, which is this idea of advanced care planning. So we thought, if you can get patients to say in advance what they want or don't want, actually, it's tricky. They can only really say what they don't want, because they can't make demands. But anyway, <laughs> if we can get them in advance to say what they don't want, then this will solve a lot of our problems. So advanced care planning came up. There were a lot of drivers for it. 
and I, I won't spend time on this because it will go on, but there'd been an era of very bad research where people hadn't got consent from patients from the Second World War and subsequently. There was the rise of the rights movement in America. There was a very particular ethical dilemma that intensive care created by being able to vent ventilate patients who would otherwise have died. And more recently, somebody has discovered that advanced care planning saves money, probably about 20% overall. Anyway, one way or another, advanced care planning was the way to go. In particular, research ethics promoted the idea of choice as the benchmark of morality, but I, I won't go into that too much. Uh, so we all understand it, obviously. Advanced care planning, we all understand advanced care planning as educated people, and, and, and we should, because if you Google it, I did this last week, 10, 10 million websites are talking about it. In fact, I re-Googled it this morning while Lisa was waiting to pick me up. Um, there are th by this morning, so from last week to this week, there are now 15 and a half million hits on Google for advanced care planning. That's, that's less than, that's one every five seconds new website about advanced care planning. So if you don't know about this, shame on you. Uh, <laughs> um, and we all make choices. I mean, this is our life. We, we, choose, we choose where we live, we choose what car to drive, we choose what job to do, we choose who to get married to. This is, this is all the way. We can even make bad choices. So um, we can choose to wear shoes that will cripple us, um, except not in the snow, as Lisa told me this morning. Uh, and we can eat bacon, which of course kills us too. E e even Danish bacon. Um, and in fact, this is all based on on a philosophical idea that we are all rugged individuals who like to be in charge and make decisions about our own lives. True? <laughs> I don't believe any of it. All of what I've just said to you, I don't believe myself. Um, now what? <laughs> well, I'll keep talking. <laughs> um, for most of us, the idea that we can just choose where we live, what we do for a living, who we get married to, and to make decisions as individuals is just complete nonsense. So for the vast majority of the world's population, this doesn't make any sense at all. In a diverse society like Australia, for most of the people we talk to, this makes no sense. Uh, this is not how people think. Um, Plus, doctors are not free to just offer whatever what somebody wants to choose. Doctors are very constrained by the system that they work in. And if somebody doesn't want treating, that's actually a problem for us because we're supposed to save people's lives and people watch us very carefully to see what we do. And um, uh, these are Norwegian people, but I imagine you are all good friends. Uh, uh, and I'm sorry, the words are again written in a philosophical way, but what they're saying is that the choices are arbitrary, that is, they're not real choices. And there's a narrow framework that you can be offered choices within. There isn't a massive amount of choice in, in how you were treated in real life. Now, Australians are weird. Now, I can't say this. Is that the right word for in Danish? Now, the word weird is technical because what it means is Western, educated, <laughs> industrialized, rich, and democratic. So if anybody's going to get on with advanced care planning, surely we Australians are going to be the ones, but we're not interested. And we have tried, and uh, you'll hear some of my efforts to try and make this work in my own institution. Um, so there's something not... We can either just say oh, advanced care planning is a really brilliant idea and people don't get it, or else maybe it's not that brilliant an idea and people are smarter than we think. That, that's the choices. Um, so what do we know about advanced care planning? What could we be talking about here? Well, there's three things. There's the, the wonderful advanced care directive, also known as the living will. There's choosing who chooses. In other words, you can appoint somebody to be your decision maker in the event you can't make decisions for yourself. Do you have that system in Denmark? And then there are complex interventions which include conversations that go on over time, having support people 
And what the last thing that Lisa mentioned, which is shared decision making, which I do want to talk about. So this is the advanced care directive. The idea is that you, in while you're still well, you anticipate what could happen to you and then write something down that would be meaningful to doctors in the event that you got into that situation. Has anybody ever tried this? I wish we had more time. <laughs> you could have a go. <laughs> uh, I have tried this. A friend of mine and I were on our way to a conference about this and we both tried to write our advanced care directives on the way thinking we'd better do this. <laughs> And then we had to tear them up because we were afraid the plane would crash and people would take them seriously. <laughs> um, and we actually did a project with 80-year-olds and we got them to write advanced care directives and went to them a week later and showed them what they'd written and said, you still want us to have this? And they said, no. <laughs> um, so the problems with advanced care directives, it was historically linked with euthanasia. So the people who invented advanced care directives were the Euthanasia Society of the USA in the 1960s. It's a legal transaction. People do not like legal transaction. It's, it's kind of like a contract. You know, this is the contract that I'm signing with the medical system. It has a low uptake and availability, only about one in eight in our studies of existing advanced care directives are ever found in the patient's notes. And the worst of the things that we've read was from Darren Haland in Canada, where he discovered that even when you had one of these things and it was in your notes, the doctors on the whole went against it. Two out of three doctors chose not to accept what you've written. This is not very promising. Um, and, and people have written, you know, enough, failure of the living will. This is 2004, already by 2004, people were not sure this was really going to be the way to go. And it puts pressure on people to try and create for themselves the perfect death. And this is the wonderful Lawrence Durrell. I'm trying to die correctly, but it's very difficult, you know. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was very English, isn't it? Um, and, and this led me to read uh, some literature, some uh, research project interviewing dying people, which is quite a good idea. And they said, how, and, and how do dying people feel? And the answer was ambivalent. That's interesting. It, it, we don't have that definiteness. I want to die at home, but not while I'm feeling like this. I know that I'm dying of cancer, but I'm hoping for a miracle. The two thoughts going on in people's minds all at the same time. And a and hundred years ago, an American philosopher said, there's always an easy solution to every human problem, neat, plausible, and wrong. And I think um, advanced care directives probably are that. So you could do another thing. You could choose who's going to choose. Families are compl completely odd. Uh, but if you choose somebody within your family or a friend to be the person who decides for you, then maybe that gives you some control over what happens. But families are complex. Um, and we struggle even to know quite what we're talking about now. <laughs> it's getting more complicated all the time. Um, but I, stood th I did this study in the intensive care unit. And when people come into hospital in Australia, they fill out this form on the front of the notes which says, who do we contact if anything goes wrong? It's called the person to contact. So we took this person to contact and said, is this who you would want us to talk to? Um, and ended up with some very peculiar results. So we found that there was nobody named. They were just blank in 10%. In 13%, it couldn't be somebody who could have legally decided for you. In 3%, they couldn't work it out all the way through the, po the thing, all the way through their admission in ICU. And in a third of the cases, the family said, oh, no, 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 don't ring her. Ring, ring, ring her. So, all oh, right, okay, now gender comes into this. Now, somebody's mentioned there's a lot of women in the audience and there's a, a, some very interesting gender issues came up here. 30% of men, uh, sorry, 30% of women didn't want their husbands to make decisions for them. All the men wanted their wives, but <laughs> <laughs> if you had daughters and sons, you always wanted your daughter to be your decision maker. And if you had sisters and brothers, it was the same, mothers versus fathers. And overall, overwhelmingly, the people who wanted, wanted to make decisions for them were women. And that was really interesting. And what happened next was really interesting as well, which was most of the women got pushed aside within the first 48 hours. So um, 
nine out of our 30 wives were overturned or resigned from the job of making decisions um, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, two of them had just left, <laughs> left the man. And uh, getting into intensive care is quite common when your wife's just left you. So <laughs> uh, that probably isn't that unusual. Um, daughters, four of them said, I want my brother to do this, not me. Um, and you can see how this goes on. So most, by end, the end of 48 hours, most of the women had been replaced, or some of the women had been replaced by men. But what was really interesting was when I woke the, gu the people up, 10 patients, seven out of 10 wanted somebody else, not the person on the front sheet, and not the person that the family had chosen, but somebody else again. So it lends weight to the idea that maybe we should choose who makes our decisions, because it seems that you can't predict that very easily just from knowing the patient and their family. They often want somebody that you weren't expecting. And there was, it, it was, a, there was obviously lots of problems. But anyway, the worst of this is, that this doesn't get any better, the worst of this is that there's no evidence that if you do choose anybody, that they're any better at guessing what you would have wanted than a random stranger. They're better than doctors who are the worst judges of all, <laughs> but they're no better than a random stranger. Um, and also, it's a very complex role. What are you actually wanting this person to do? Are they a witness to what's happening to you? Are they a substitute who are trying to stand in your shoes? Or are they just somebody making a decision based on what they want? And there's a lot of dispute about exactly what these people are supposed to do. Maybe they're trying to make your decisions more authentic. But here you are. This is your exercise. Imagine you're in a restaurant. So this is audience participation. It's late. I'm trying to stay awake here. Um, imagine you're in a restaurant and your partner rings up and says, look, I'm going to be 10 minutes late. Can you order for me? Okay, easy one. <laughs> what you know about your partner, we'll call him he for the sake of argument. What you know about your partner is he's a little bit overweight. His doctor says, look, look out for your cholesterol. <laughs> but his favorite food is bacon double cheeseburgers. <laughs> and this restaurant does a brilliant bacon double cheeseburger. Um, so you could choose the bacon double cheeseburger or you could go for the green salad. <laughs> now the green salad would be good because when your partner walks in, it would look virtuous that he's eating this green salad. Everybody would go, oh, you're eating a green salad, it's good, you should do this, look after your weight, it's very good for your cholesterol. So your green salad or cheeseburger, and now you vote. In that situation, who would buy the double bacon cheeseburger? Oh, good. Okay, who, who would go for the green salad? Uh, okay. You see what I'm saying is that when you're deciding for somebody else, it isn't necessarily that you're trying to guess what they would want. You'd be more influenced by what you think they should want uh, or the person that you would like them to be. Uh, so exactly what you are doing as a substitute decision maker is not very clear to me. Uh, I voted, incidentally, for the bacon double cheeseburger, so I was with the majority. We're the libertarians. That's what I like to think. <laughs> um, and what this says is, I'm telling you, this is the sheep speaking, I'm telling you the man and the dog are definitely working together. For God's sake, Trevor, always you with that conspiracy stuff. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> so uh, I think what I'm saying is that... <laughs> Is that what, what we're trying to what we're trying to do is is work with the families, but it's very it's not clear to us exactly what their role is um, in this regard. And I think we need to do a lot more philosophical thinking about what do we want from people's families when they can't speak for themselves. So anyway, then we, that brings us to the complex interventions. Now, complex interventions are much more complicated than either of those things. But the thing about complex interventions is they might work. So this is where we're at. This is the wonderful Agnes van der Heider, if you know her. Um, but they did a meta-analysis of the effectiveness of advanced care planning on end-of-life care and concluded that complex interventions were more effective than written instructions. And what that needed was people to support them, literature to give them. It was iterative. It went back and forth and stepwise. So you do one level of planning while you're well, and then if you get sick, you do another level, and if you get very sick, it goes to another level. Um, so this works. But this is a paradigm shift, for those who are familiar with the idea of paradigm shifts. This is a paradigm shift from where we started. Now we're talking about 
not just writing something on a piece of paper, but a complex interaction with people who may well have to be trained to do this kind of work. Uh, so we did. So this is we spent a lot of money on this. This was called the Respecting Patient Choices Program, which we borrowed from La Crosse, Wisconsin. And we trained all the staff on several wards in John Hunter Hospital to have advanced care planning conversations. And uh, Lisa Shaw and I spent many a happy these were two-day trainings, so it was quite lengthy. Uh, many a happy day doing this. Highly positive result, briefly. Um, but by the end of a year, everybody we'd trained to stop doing it. They just weren't interested in still doing it. They were very enthusiastic when we trained them, and then they just, in the end, didn't want to do it. And it, it wasn't sustained when the funding stopped. So we thought, we can't afford to keep doing that. Um, so we invented something else again. This is probably the most complex intervention yet because this is online. So what we did was we identified people in the last year of their lives and gave them access to a computer program which gave them, gave them a book. A it wasn't a real book. It was like a, a virtual book with pages. And they could write things and they could read things and we, when we made notes, they could read the notes. When they made notes, we could read the notes. And they could chart how well they were on a graph. I'm like, I'm like that. Um, and they could put in plans and stuff like that. Brilliant. Three million dollars they gave me to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not showing you the results yet. Um, but the, part of the reason why we did this was that this, we did some prior research looked at what happened to people in the last year of their lives. And this is how you spend the last year of your life, just so you've got something to look forward to. Um, you go and see your GP 14 times in the last year of your life, uh, a specialist eight times. You can see there the pharmacist you go to 21 times, and you get 25 visits in your home. This adds up to 103. So once every three days, you're making contact with the medical system. And it's a hopeless tangle in Australia if you go and see your GP, the specialist doesn't know. If you see your specialist, the GP doesn't know. So we thought, well, have a web. It's web-based. It's going to be absolutely brilliant. And the, the 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 state government thought so as well and gave us lots of money. Um, and it was easy to find patients in the last year of their life. That's not so hard. But we discovered ninety percent of them had no computer, which I guess we should have expected. Uh, what we didn't realise was that. 50% uh, of them were already completely dependent on a carer uh, and weren't capable of interacting with a computer even if they had one. Um, almost none of them knew what advanced care planning was when we came to talk to them about it, but thought it was a brilliant idea. And the IT person that we sent round, they wanted to make an advanced care plan with somebody who's just an IT person because they thought it was such a good idea. So this has struggled to work. Um, but not, we haven't given up, we've got more funding because, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why actually, <laughs> we have got more funding to try and make this actually work. Um, which brings us to the most complex idea of all, and the most complex idea of all is to reframe the decision-making process between doctors and patients as a shared process. Now, um, Hippocrates would be turning in his grave and the reason for that is, this is what Hippocrates thought. Um, patients must place themselves fully in physicians' hands and obey commands. <laughs> that doesn't sound like shared decision-making and isn't. And, but this is the way we've all grown up. I mean, those of us who trained in medicine grew up thinking that patients really are supposed to do what they're told. Uh, but that more, more realist, in more philosophical terms, that our role was to be beneficent. In other words, to do good for the patients. It didn't matter too much what they wanted. We had to do good. That's what we grew up thinking. 5,000 years, that was the way. Until this troublemaker, Kathy Charles, came along. The late Kathy Charles, she's died now. But in 1997, she did a good formulation of what shared decision-making might mean. And she used a very unusual title. It takes at least two to tango. 
that means there could be three people doing the tango, and I've never seen that in my life. I don't even know what that would look like. But it is a bit like what we try to do, actually, because you've often got the family and the patient and the healthcare team all trying to tango with each other. So it is a three-person tango. Um, and this is the breakthrough idea that, that uh, Kathy Charles was talking about, which is that for shared decisions to occur, there needs to be a two-way exchange, not only of information, which is where we <coughs> started, um, but of treatment preferences. In other words, the doctor may have treatment preferences, the patient may have treatment preferences, and the idea is to somehow come up with a preference that will work overall. So you s what you're doing is you're reframing the doctor not as the expert, but as somebody who just has preferences about what they would want to do with you, and that you're an expert as well on the same footing, and you have preferences, and you try and make those preferences work with each other. This is so scary, I can hardly even talk about it. <laughs> Um, because it throws out of the window all the authority, really, in a sense, that doctors have come to expect to have. So it's a huge loss of control over what's happening. Um, and uh, I, I haven't got time to talk about cases, but the law has not treated this favourably yet. They still think we should be doing the right thing rather than what patients want us to do. Uh, so I think Hippocrates, as I say, would find this very difficult. Now, my, my specialty, intensive care, and that of a few others, including Lisa here, um, were early adopters of this idea. Um, and actually, it's my fault. Because I went to this conference, which was the weirdest conference I've ever been to in my life. Um, and it was a consensus conference. There was weeping. There was shouting. It was as well. That I was the only Australian there. I was sent. It was a, a US... European conference and the Europeans were saying particularly the southern Europeans Italians all right um, <laughs> were saying it's all a doctor's decision if if somebody is sick and they can't speak then I choose which is also what happens in England um, the Americans were saying oh well we think it's the family who chooses we maybe they sh it's all about what they've said in the past and I went along <laughs> And I said, why don't you call it shared? Because I'd read Kathy Charles's thing. Why don't you share it? So they put out this statement. We advocate a shared approach. But they had no idea what they were talking about. It was just, just a word, really, at the time, because there's no mechanism for it. But by 2012, this is what New England Journal was saying. Shared, the pinnacle of patient-centered care. That's pretty high. The pinnacle of patient-centered care. And there is some empirical evidence. So if you say to these are outpatient, outpatient clinics. Do you want to make your own decisions? Yeah, closer to no. Somewhere in between no and maybe. Um, this is Doran, Darren Hayland. Who should decide what to do with your mum? Family decides or the doctor decides. Well, only half a percent wanted the family to make the decision and only 15% wanted the doctor to make a decision. The vast majority wanted a combination. So there's a lot of empirical evidence that families like this idea of sharing decision-making. Reality, worst game ever. Um, <laughs> uh, this is difficult to read, but it's an attempt at a meta-analysis of shared decision-making. But what you can see is that everybody's, everybody who wrote papers had a different idea about what shared decision making would look like so it's hard to put it all together um, and this is this is Randy Curtis the always cheerful Randy Curtis and he videotaped his staff interacting with patients families and scored them about whether or not they'd done shared decision making less than two percent could tick the box and if these are French oncologists uh, for who definitely don't do shared decision making um, and cautionary notes from a variety of different sources. It's not a lay down. I had to put this in. You all get the reference. <laughs> I don't need to say it. I swear I won't mention Hans Christian Andersen anymore. Um, but really there isn't overwhelming evidence for shared decision making and particularly not at end of life where it's, it's different if it was for cosmetic surgery or having a PSA for prostate cancer, but for end of life, it's very difficult to come up with good evidence for it. However, 
the important thing about shared decision making, it's not just a paradigm shift, it's a revolution and it's exciting and I'm excited. Um, it's philosophically different from where we started out and that's exciting. Um, so we won't worry about John Stuart Mill too much, but this was the crude idea of autonomy that the Americans picked up and that we've all had to run with, that everybody's sovereign over their own bodies and nobody should touch them unless they want it and we're all individuals. Um, but this is Mary Wollstonecraft. There's a suburb named after this woman in Sydney, <laughs> one of the first of the feminist philosophers. But the feminist philosophers came up with the idea of relational autonomy. In other words, we aren't individuals. We're actually only individuals in the sense that we are connected with other people. And um, a New Zealand philosopher called Annette Bayer, I think, said it very well. If we ask ourselves what actually enables people to be autonomous, the answer is not isolation, but relationships with parents, teachers, friends, loved ones. Or to put it more simply, people need help to be independent. Interesting paradoxical thought. Um, <laughs> had to put this in. <laughs> only, the only the most diehard philosophers will know that this was Wittgenstein's favourite puzzle. Do you, what do you see there? Hands up who sees a duck. Hands up who sees a rabbit. Okay, now hands up who sees a rabbit. <laughs> Once you've seen the rabbit, you see the rabbit. And I think that the, this is the problem. It's been hiding in plain sight all along. We had the wrong idea about what we were looking at. We, we should have been looking at relationships and we were looking at individuals. So... Um, <laughs> to <laughs> Look, I had to put jokes in. It's the end of the day, and you've been. Um, so, w where have we got to? Um, so, these are my conclusions, and we got we're finishing quite early. So, it's all a relief. Everybody loves to finish early with conferences. Um, so these are, the, these are my practical suggestions for people who are interested in advanced care planning. Number one, take the focus away from dying. Advanced care planning is not linked to death. Advanced care planning is linked to loss of capacity. So in other words, you're not planning to die, you're just planning to have somebody else speak for you. It makes life a lot easier. It's an easier conversation to have. In fact, I would ban the term end of life altogether. All you are is chronically sick and your diseases can be managed but not cured. End of life is retrospective. We only knew it was the end of your life because you died. <laughs> so end of life is not a real thing. It's just an idea that we have. What you're really dealing with is people who are frail, increasingly frail, making a lot of contact with the health system and having some unusual needs that aren't being met. And that's really what you're dealing with. So don't talk about end of life. Just talk about seriously ill people who, who can't be cured. Take the focus off dying when it comes to advanced care planning. Don't try and get them to write a legal contract and sign it, which is what we tried to do for a long time. Here's, a, here's the form, just right here. I don't want CPR, um, and we're all happy. I don't think there's much to be said for doing that. Um, I think you have a supported conversation with people that goes right up until the final day that they die. This won't please everybody. But I would have to say this whole process and the whole of end of life is not, not owned by the palliative care service. Um, now the, there will be people here from specialist palliative care, and I mean no offence. <laughs> but palliative care, and this is an English expression, and you may have to translate this for me, but have bitten off more than they can chew. Is that, th is that a s expression that you understand? Um, Palliative care started from the hospice movement. Dame Cicely Saunders in, the, in London, I worked for her as, as a volunteer when I was a medical student. Uh, and the idea was that um, people who were dying were not being treated well in the acute system and were moved into the hospice. This was the hospice movement and it was very exciting and I loved it, I thought it was brilliant. But now that we've moved to a cancer not being the dominant way people die, um, that people mostly die with at least 3.7 comorbidities. It's complicated. You can't predict when they're going to die. They die of heart failure. They die of dementia. And palliative care 
has a limited role. They die of kidney disease and uh, uh, the best people to treat palliatively people with kidney disease who are dying are people who know a lot about kidney disease. Anyway, I don't want to offend palliative care service, but I think we have to break up the idea of palliative care, that it's more everybody's business in special ways, uh, depending on niche. I think dying in intensive care is fine, and I think pa intensive care specialists are actually very good at managing dying, intensive care nurses. Um, so I, I, I don't think everybody who dies needs to go to the palliative care service. I think it's not like that. Anyway, people will kill me afterwards. Um, I think it's very important to separate what we're talking about from euthanasia. Um, everywhere I go, people say, advanced care planning, oh, so you support euthanasia. Actually, I'm not a supporter of euthanasia, as it happens. Uh, I'm agnostic about euthanasia. The thing I don't like about euthanasia is they think it solves a whole bunch of problems that it doesn't solve. All of what I'm talking about isn't solved by euthanasia. Um, but it, we have to, when we're talking about advanced care planning, keep it separate from euthanasia. And I, I think in the end, we're going to have to put this online, but I, this is electronic medical records uh, is going to be the solution, and I'm dreading it. Um, theoretical conclusions. Advanced care planning's made a lot of mistakes and was based on the wrong philosophy. They got the wrong idea about autonomy. Shared decision-making is nothing less than a revolution in medicine. We have to embrace ambivalence and let people make bad choices. And maybe all we're trying to do is build trust. And this is the greatest of all philosophers, as you know. Uh, the one thing we can't do is not do anything because the, the thing that will guarantee failure is we don't try anything. So we have to be prepared to try things, at least. It's what we owe our elders. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.